Well, I think we can all agree that Wade did an excellent job. And thank you, Wade, for reminding us of all the things that we should be thankful for. While all those guys were leading songs, Sam had me scared that I was going to click the button and y'all were all going to hear my bass singing. And that wouldn't have probably been a good thing. Well, there, it's no secret that there are many problems in this world today. But not just in the world, but in this nation, the nation that was founded on Christian morals. A nation that was founded by people who came here, who were being persecuted in England, came here and established their country for them, for Christians. And though they might not have been Christians, they had the Christian mindset, the Christian morals. But how far has this country come from the day it was established? Over the past 50 years, our nation has declined and declined. And it's been declining since the first day it was founded. And there are many people out there who are against Christians. The atheists, the Scientologists, all of them are against us. And what's sad is a lot of the times they're more willing to speak up. So with all of the problems, what can a Christian do to turn this country around and to turn this church around? Well, so today I want to look at some of the problems and what a Christian needs to be doing. In today's culture, problems include things such as drugs, drinking, smoking, adultery, pornography, divorce, Hollywood, and we'll touch a little bit on Hollywood in just a moment, abortion, and one that is overlooked most of the time is a bad representation of what a Christian truly is. Nowadays, people can call themselves Christians and they're believed. A Christian, someone can go to a bar every Friday night, get drunk, go home Saturday, and beat his wife, but if he calls himself a Christian, he is representing what a Christian is in this country. And it's a sad thing to think that everybody is believing that that person is a Christian. And Christians are not doing a good enough job of representing Christ alone. We have a great congregation here. And I'm glad to be a member of this congregation because most people here are representing Christ the way they're supposed to. But there are those who still are not doing that. And those in the world, they're influencing Christians. The worldly influence is everywhere we go. We walked into Walmart and it's there. Walmart is pretty worldly if you've ever been. And it's sad to think that once we walk in there, we're already being influenced by the world. Most Christians are strong enough and can say that they're influenced by it, but they're able to stay away from that influence and t stay away from the temptation of living worldly lives. But in many cases, they're influenced and they start to slip away. They start to live worldly lives. And it's also because, like I mentioned earlier, that a lot of non-Christians, a lot of atheists especially, are willing to step up and attack the Christian. Where before Christians would stand up and defend what they believe, now they're starting to slip back into their seats and bow their head when someone starts attacking a Christian. And instead of standing up, and fighting for what they believe in, defending themselves. They're letting atheists run over them. Like I said, our congregation is good, and we have many people stepping up. Uh, today is a good example when we have all of the young guys stepping up. But in most churches, or most congregations, we are losing so many of our youth. I believe the statistic is 80%. When the youth goes off to college, we're losing 80% of the youth. And brethren, that's not okay. If we continue at that pace, where are we going to be 50 years from now? 50 years ago, the church was strong. And it's been losing its strength ever since. Now going back to Hollywood, like I mentioned earlier, Hollywood is one of the world's biggest influences. It is filled with sin. Every month you have a new movie come out, and it's filled with sin, whether it be foul language, whether it be inappropriate dressing, whether it be sexual content, it's filled with sin. And I want to sidetrack for just a second. We as Christians should not let Hollywood represent the definition of what modesty is. In most cases, 
in movies, you'll see women dressed with high shorts and just inappropriate, or men dressed the same. And that's not modesty. Modesty is defined in the Bible. So if you're ever curious of what modesty is or if an outfit is okay, the answers are in the Bible. And don't let Hollywood define modesty. In news related to Hollywood, you have Matthew McConaughey thanking God for um, his award. I think it was in Best Actor. And I believe it was Dallas Buyers Club or gang, whatever it is. And that's both good and bad. It's good that someone was willing to step up and thank God in a room and in a place where it's normally frowned upon. But the bad thing on that is that he was rewarded for a movie that he shouldn't have been in. If he loved God so much and he was so thankful for God to giving him all his abilities, he shouldn't have been in a movie that is filled with sin. And we do not need to let the world influence us in that. But sadly, some Christians are. And their mindset are becoming corrupt. There are weaker Christians and there are stronger Christians. And each are being influenced. But the stronger Christian, I want to focus on that just for a moment. The stronger Christian is being influenced in the negative way as well. Some Christians are becoming like the Pharisee in Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. And this is the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector, the parable. And Jesus said uh, this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector standing far, or standing like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. There are a lot of Christians, strong Christians, that are becoming too much like the Pharisee. They're exalting themselves and saying, I'm just the greatest thing ever. When in reality, Christians need to be more humbled. We need to be more and more like the, ta um, the tax collector, being humbled and knowing that we are still sinners. And instead of exalting ourselves, reaching down and helping others who are having problems. One problem that we are having today is with people exalting themselves. For an example of this, um, someone can come up to you and say, Yeah, you see so-and-so over there? So-and-so, I invited them a month ago to church, and now they're, they're strong Christians, they've been baptized, they're doing the Lord's work. You can say, I saved them, that's my work right there. First, that's your work, okay, but you did not save them. Jesus Christ saved them many years ago. And second, that's great, you invited someone to church, and they accepted the word, and they're doing good work. That is wonderful, we need more of that. So why, instead of gloating about it, you go out there and do it again. We can never have enough evangelists to go out into the world and preach what the Bible says. To help your friends come to church. To help your co-workers come to church. Some Christians, not all Christians, but some Christians are starting to slip away. They're becoming lukewarm. Well, they'll do the bare minimum. They'll come to church Sunday morning. They'll skip Bible class. Sunday morning, they'll come, take of communion, give a contribution. But then that's the last time other members of this congregation see them. And that's happening everywhere. They're becoming lukewarm. They're losing their zeal for Christ. A lot of Christians are becoming hypocrites. They'll preach one thing and then go and do another. They'll say, you shouldn't be doing this to a sinner and then they'll go and do the same thing. They're not trying to help themselves. They're only trying to attack others and what they believe. And in some cases, Christians are becoming liberal in ways of worship. Um, one of my favorite TV shows, Duck Dynasty. 
A&E. They're doing great work. They're, help, they're showing the world what a Christian should be like. They're showing the mindset of a Christian, Christian morals. And that's great. They're doing great. The problem is the congregation that they go to is becoming a liberal congregation. When singing, they'll clap their hands. They'll let women get up and lead services or lead prayers. And that's becoming liberal in ways of worship. And we need to stray away from that and not become liberal, but become more strong in our ways of worship and have a strong foundation of what we believe. And of course, the obvious one that some Christians are becoming, some Christians are becoming worldly. Where before they were strong Christians, but now the world has their grasp on them and they're pulling them down. And they're pulling them down to levels of they don't believe anymore, that they'll fall away and become atheists. And they're becoming more and more worldly in ways of everything. And Christians are also starting to become more and more afraid to stick out. I see it a lot of the time in some youth, most of the time, not necessarily from this congregation, but people like Baptists or people like Methodists. They're children in their youth, and I, I'm sticking with youth because that's what I am and that's what I see in high school. But they'll say that they're Christians. But when an atheist comes up, up, they just sink down because they don't want to stick out. They want to be like everybody else. They want to be have the fun that everyone else has. And brother, it's okay to stick out as a Christian. We should stick out. We should show the world what a Christian looks like. We need to be the light unto the world. But how do we as Christians stray from this? Turn to Romans 12, verses 9 through 13. The marks of a true Christian. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in the Spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. This is what makes up a true Christian. We, we as Christians need to stray from the world and be like this. We need to show honor. We need to be fervent in the Spirit. We need to always be praying. But even when Christians are like this and we are doing that, I ask a question, who's going to represent us? Like I said earlier, this nation is going downhill. And this world is going downhill. So who is going to represent the Christian? Well, if you look at political parties and you turn to them, you see that majority of politicians are wishy-washy. They'll stand for one thing one year, but five years from now, they'll stand for something else. In news related, most politicians five years ago, Republican politicians, were against homosexual marriages. They voted against it every chance they got. But now that the homosexual caucus has grown and they see that there are voters there, they're allowing homosexual marriages because they are protecting themselves. One of my favorite politicians, Ted Cruz, said this a few weeks ago. If there is one thing that unifies politicians of both parties, you know that their top priority is preserving their own hide. That is what politicians in most cases are doing. Now, not all politicians are like this. Some do represent Christian morals. But many politicians are against Christian beliefs. So I ask again, who is going to represent the Christian? Why not Christians? In most cases, you have that person in your life that you would do anything for. You want to see them happy. You'd defend them if someone was attacking them. It could be a child, it could be your spouse, it could be a brother, a sister, it could be anybody, it could be even a friend. You would do anything for them. You want to see them happy, and you don't want to see someone attacking them. But brothers, I ask you a question. You would lay your life down for that person, you defend them, but why will you not defend Christ? Some Christians are defending Christ, but many are not. Someone will step up and say something against Christ, but they won't step up to Christ's defense. They won't defend him. And they'll defend that other person, but they won't defend Christ. And I ask you, why not? Christ, who we are called to love above all others in Luke 14, 25, 
We should defend Him before any other. We should love Him above everyone else. We as Christians need to stand up and represent Christ. We need to fight for what we believe in. When someone stands up and attacks our belief, we need to stand up and defend our beliefs. We need to grow, be stronger in biblical knowledge. If you hold a belief, you need to be able to defend that belief. If someone starts preaching against baptism, we should be able to re pull out our Bible and turn to verses and show them that baptism is necessary. We need to grow stronger and stronger as Christians in our knowledge and our spiritual lives. We need to stand up and fight for what we believe in. We, and we need to reach out and help others. In a lot of cases, Christians are strong and they'll defend their Christian beliefs. But in many times, um, they will not go out and evangelize. An opportunity arises and they're afraid that they might offend somebody. And so instead of inviting them to church, they just let them walk by and the opportunity is gone. In most cases, when I've heard a preacher preach about evangeliz evangelizing, especially when it's directed towards a youth, they always say that this time in your life is going to be the greatest time that you can reach out and evangelize. That now that they are older, that they see the opportunities that they had. And those opportunities are no longer there when, as they are becoming adult or as they're adults. They say in high school and junior high, that's the greatest time to evangelize. Andy always asks us in our Bible classes on Wednesday, when is the last time that you have sat down and have a Bible study with one of your friends? We, as a youth especially, guys, need to step up and start evangelizing. But it doesn't stop at the youth. Everyone needs to start evangelizing more. Our church is shrinking and shrinking. Like I said, we are losing 80% of the youth. Luckily, we have a strong youth, and I don't believe we will lose that many. But it is still possible with the worldly reach and grasp on most Christians. Christians need to step up and start evangelizing and helping others. There's, Ronald Reagan said this best, and I love this quote about our nation. Without God, there is no virtue, because there is no prompting of the conscience. Without God, there is no coursing of the society. Without God, democracy will not and cannot long endure. If we ever forget that we are one nation under God, then we will be one nation gone under. If Christians aren't reaching out to help others, to help this nation come back to the Christian morals it was established on, our nation will go under. It will become a nation of corrupt. Our nation is now going downhill. And I'll ask the question, how close are we to Sodom and Gomorrah? Sodom and Gomorrah was filled with sin. Not a Christian was in sight. And if the old Christians are starting to die, and newer Christians are not evangelizing, and they soon die, who's going to be left to defend Christ and hold Christ and the Christian morals that this nation was founded upon? We need to reach out, and we need to defend our beliefs, and we need to fight for Christ. And brethren, I know it's terrifying sometimes. It, when you look someone in the eye and you're about to defend you, your belief and they're a strong atheist, it can be terrifying. But we needn't be afraid of events like that. We need to look forward to encounters like that to help someone in their Christian beliefs. Remember Paul was in prison. Most of his writings are from when he was in prison. So even in prison, he was able to preach. He was still willing to preach when in prison. And in most cases, when he would go to one congregation or one city, he'd preach the word of God, and then he'd be chased out of that city. And most of the time, he was running for his life. They were wanting to kill him. But you know what Paul did? He kept going and he went to the next city and did the same thing and then to the next city and did the same thing. And then when he was imprisoned, he kept writing to those cities that he helped Christians grow. And we need to be more like Paul. And also like Paul, we need to be more like David in our spirit. 
Psalm 3.6, I will not be afraid of many of thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. We need to not be afraid of the people. We need to help those around us. And remember, it is always worth it in the end. Romans 8.18, For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Though we may suffer now, though we may be persecuted, we may be imprisoned, it is always worth it when we look at what is to come in eternity. Eternity in glory or eternity in damnation are our choices. And brethren, we need to choose eternity in heaven. And we need to take as many people with us as we can. Now, we can only show them the door. We can't push them through it. They have to make that decision by themselves. But we need to lead more Christians to the, or need to lead more people to that door and show them the way of salvation. We needn't be afraid. We as Christians need to stand up for our beliefs as Christ commanded us to do in Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded to you. But also notice how it, he closes. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We needn't be afraid because Jesus is with us. When we stand up and represent Christ, Jesus is right by our side. We don't need to be afraid of the world when we have Jesus there to defend us. Jesus is still with His own. He's always going to be there for us, even until the end. So, even as we draw closer and closer to the end, He's still with us. No matter how bad this world is and how corrupt it becomes, Jesus is with His own. His, the Christians that represent Christ, He's going to stand for. But we need to start helping others and defending others. In the closing of this lesson, we always like to offer an invitation, a chance for people to come forward and put Christ on through baptism. Brethren, I encourage you, if you have not put Christ on through baptism, that you do so now. This nation is becoming corrupt. This nation is, has to make a stand for Christian morals. And if you're baptized... What better way to say, I am a Christian and I'm going to defend Christ than putting Christ on through baptism? Or maybe you're here today and you are a Christian, but you haven't been standing up for Christ like, you sh like we need to be. And you've been slowly letting the world take its grasp on you and pull you down to it. You've become worldly and you've become corrupt like this nation. Brethren, whatever your need is, I ask that you would come forward as we stand and as we sing.